family, I know only the family at Tala. Kutia Tower, the Rokumat Mutula, a Kutaranaki to the Rokki. Tina Kata, Tina Kata, Tina Rakata Kato. It's, um, it's always a bit intimidating presenting with Sean because the depth of his work um, and the relevance of this is quite extraordinary. But it's also quite normal. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about this, this Whakatoki in a minute. But I want to start by acknowledging, because this book has just been finished, here's my chance to say thank you to my own whanau to the Kaumatua, to the people in the iwi, the hapu, um, the trusts, uh, the council, uh, the youth of academic institutions who supported uh, myself and the others over a four year process to get here. This is almost the end of it in some ways, or it won't be. So I'm really just picking up a few themes. Sue Jackson, who is an Australian planner, this is one of the statements that has really guided what we are doing. Planning didn't start in 1840, or didn't start in 1839 in with Wakefield. We've always had the idea that we need to express ourselves in a structured way, especially around the natural environment and building an environment. She's written, she's just contributing to a book called Reclaiming Indigenous Planning, which I highly recommend. So I've really stuck into that. I'm focusing on the future. So in Wellington, and if you want to know more of the history, I'm not going to give you a lot of it. It's mostly in here or in the Waitangi Tribunal report. We have two um, organisations which hold a land and one in particular which holds the Mana Whenua. So following the treaty settlement in Wellington, the Port Nicholson Box Settlement Trust was set up. And their goal, they decided, was to restore, revise, strengthen and enhance, and please really note this bit, the cultural, social and economic well-being of the family of Taranaki Whanau, that's the wider Taranaki people of Te Upoko Otika, the head of the fish, our area. The other group who hold the trust, who I'm connected, uh, who hold small but not insignificant land shares in Wellington and who have in the past been very influential is the Wellington Tennis Trust. And again, what the trust has always talked about is that package of everything. So how does this grow into something you can do something about? The research I did, and again you can find a bit more about it somewhere else, I talked to a wide range of Tango Fenua and Wellington, and I was looking not for the for things that illuminated and supported those visions, those formalised visions. And three themes really came out over three years of um, reading, discussing, who are we formal, who are we interviews, etc. These are distinctive to Wellington. I think one of the points that I keep on making is if you interview people in Christchurch, Dunedin, Hamilton, you would find things that were common, but you would find things that were different about the different history. And the first one in particular is very much a Wellington one. Unearthing the layers. It's interesting how often as I interview people, they talked about unearthing or digging up. They talked about visibility and being seen. And they talked about, often about the cultural footprint, but about growing and expanding, recognising that we are, um, we were in a strong, we become in a strong position. But the sense that there was a, a bit of frustration, that there wasn't as much expansion as was planned, as was hoped. So, oh, it is. So those are my think, big things. This is what we had. This is the Taripa area. It's before the 1844 and the 1850s quakes. But it 
is a very thriving economic community. It was trading. It was trading in and out of the city. People were trading right up around the coasts. It was a building growing city. What happened to it? What happened to it? Summarised by Tracy McIntosh, whom I respect a lot. But written over, I often think of it based on the interviews that I did with people as being concreted over. We were concreted over. Where did we get to? This is what we got to. So when I first came to Wellington, the area was our Papa Harbour. That's the bottom, the lower end of Tamaki Street. We were, it was white, in fact it was a very grey city in very respects. And underneath it, there was nothing that we knew about. We knew nothing of our own toys. And the picture on the bottom left is something that please, I ask every single one of you to go either today or very near in future to walk down to Taranaki Street and in the block, after you get to the, the um, BP station, walk up there and the little building on your left, you will see what has been unearthed of Tarapa, which was once a big thriving settlement. It is only one of many settlements around Wellington City and around the harbour, but it's right in the CBD. And it was the CBD before there was a CBD. Those are houses, and there are other things in there. Everybody I interviewed spontaneously mentioned this space. It had a sort of meaning to people that I had never expected. Something about it was resonating. The fact that they didn't know about it, the fact that it made things real for them. But the next thing was, what are we going to do with this? So for each one of the themes, I'm just going to talk briefly about what people thought could be done and what I think can be connected to. There was a recognition. Everybody recognises that Tiatewa, Tamaki, Whanariwi are relatively recent arrivals. The long body heritage of the city is one that we have inherited. We have a responsibility which has been taken on by the trusts and by the Hubu to look after. How do we put that into the plans? People said it needs to be in the plan. It needs to be, stories need to be told to everyone. So few people know what is there, partly because it hasn't been written out in ways that are easy to access. And the other big thing which I think comes across, and um, we'll talk about probably more here, is going outside the neighbourhoods, the, the, the single CBD. Northland, where I live, you would never guess that there was any Māori history there. Kelburn, you might not know that there was a Māori history there, and yet there's a very deep Māori history, and in fact a recent and very interesting Māori history. Island Bay, which had a Māori tour settlement. So we need to expand into the city as a whole. The next thing and one where people were starting to feel very, the people I interviewed were starting to feel positive, and as I've been going back and talking to them informally recently, they do, is, is around becoming more visible, but it's still a challenge. Do you really know what this is? Yes? Yeah. Right. Go to the petrol station. Oh, sorry. Done. Skipped on you. <coughs> There's a Z petrol station in Vivian Street, and when they were building it, they found that somewhere under it, and they dug up the concrete and unearthed, was a little bit of Waimaki stream. We had streams and river sources, all of which had names and very deep stories. And very sensibly, the people at Z went to talk to the council and they talked to the Iwi, and so there is a little monument there, and a very beautiful piece of sculpture, I think, carved into brick by Rai Vincent, of Mapihi, after whom Mapihi is named. 
If we had those stories everywhere, what could we do? One of the things, the things that really um, inspired me in the last couple of years as an architect in Victoria, in Melbourne, called Ruben Burke, an Indigenous architect, who was also involved in lots of placemaking. And he talked about everyday visibility. He said, Melbourne, you shouldn't be able to go more than a few metres without seeing something that reminds you that this was a big Indigenous settlement. And I thought, yes, this is what my interviews were saying. Why isn't there something everywhere, every day, that reminds us that we are there? The words that people I interviewed used were, were real, concrete, public. We're not just dragged out for special occasions. So one of the ideas that came up and that I've been involved in a little bit, but I think is an opportunity for Wellington, is to look at how we can really build a lot of community participation and planning. So a couple of years ago, for the first time, the annual district annual plan, there was a, a, a Māori constitution, or an open one, which was very um, informal, and a lot of really good ideas came out of that. But we could have those everywhere. We could bring in young people, we could bring in our old people. We could work much more informally, and we could do that all the time. Everyday visibility. The third thing which I think goes to planning is growing the footprint. So the original cultural footprint that we people talked about is Tirokura. And that over the time we've been working on this has become much more of an economic footprint. So again, if you haven't, if you've got visitors to Wellington, take them on one of the walking tours. Take them in the waka. But how does this go into planning? There was a really strong feeling that we've got to have all those things together. The problem is that the planning structures struggle to cope with that. We all know that, despite their best efforts. The things that the people I interviewed and have talked to recently were focusing on were bringing money back into the city. So if we're thinking about what's going on in Shelley Bay, which is, I know it's very controversial, but the aim behind that is to put us back into the city from which we were effectively ethnically cleansed. Being visible in the economic space. Being visible in lots of Māori organisations. Hui, Wānanga, planning. And I just remind you that there was an urban growth implementation plan, which didn't even make sense. I haven't looked at a more recent implementation plan. But I think there is a gap there, at the same time there's an opportunity that must be taken. I'm just going to show you this slide, I'm not going to talk through it, but I really recommend to you if you haven't looked at them, two things. One is, this is the Te Arana Māori Design Principles, developed by a Māori group, particularly led by Rao And these are now being built into Auckland Council's processes. They have a whole website full of guidance. It's a very, very readable thing to do. They've tried to express this in lots of different ways. The other thing which I have got is that work was done by the Aho and a group of very motivated people, um, and Papa Konami, the Māori Planners Group, on a Māori Planning Futures Report, which I can give you a link to. And that is was a response to the Productivity Commission. It's very powerful, it's very relevant, it's full of practical things that you could do. This, this statue has really um, come to symbolise a lot to me. And I've been talking to historians about that nature of and the Fun. It was a planned journey. They didn't just it. They didn't know where they were going. They were exploring the new, the different but it was a purposeful journey. And this statue shows they're not starving, they're looking strongly in the direction. They are guided by their kamatoa, their tuanga. They are also led by, and the woman whose name has different names in different places, who spotted <coughs> this country. 
It was a purposeful journey, and we can take a purposeful journey. We don't have to know entirely where we are going, but if we're guided by principles and aims, we can make that happen. Kia ora tātou. 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 Thank you for giving up your precious lunchtime to come and listen to us. Uh, give us give a few ideas about how we should plan our cities. Uh, we'll try and keep this brief. I know you want to get back and uh, buy your sushi and get back to work. So, uh, so a couple of ideas. <clears throat> so in, in terms of approaching planning, the, the approach that we've been pushing for is a dual approach. as a one which recognises the validity of Mātauranga Māori, Te Ao Māori, alongside our Western planning traditions, Te Ao Pākehā. In this way, it empowers Māori in terms of the knowledge they have, and in terms of the, the quality, quality of the position they have within the decision-making processes for planning. So whaka māhere is to plan. And the idea behind this little diagram is that we have the two worldviews working together towards a shared outcome. To do this, a proposed framework that we've been developing uh, promotes the idea that mana whenua, people who are of the land, tangata whenua, who have decision making <coughs> rights over natural resources in a particular area, have rights and interests to participate in local government planning processes. So if you get that right, maybe through joint committees, maybe through co-governance arrangements, then it's a good start. The next step is to identify those core principles, similar to from uh, the slide that Kiriata presented with regard to Te Aranga's Māori Design Guide. There's some principles there, but there's a whole host out there. It just depends on who you're talking to. Each yeah. and Hapu are very context-specific in terms of uh, the values that they hold dear to them. So there's no universal approach. So to have that in mind, to recognise the context specificity of Indigenous knowledge of Maitaranga Māori. Once you get that step done, the next step is to work together collaboratively through co-design, through co-governance, in terms of identifying what are those shared outcomes that the community wants. So you have to bring the community in, it's not just you and Hapu partners, the entire community has to have a goal that they want to work towards. Um, so, for example, within the, the rebuild of Christchurch, what happened there was that they, in terms of their central city plan, it was an awesome approach. They got Mana Whenua on board, they got Ngāto Hill on board, worked with the community in terms of having a shared vision of where they wanted to go with their rebuild for that city. And then once you have that sorted out, identifying those goals and objectives, putting measurables around working towards that progress of, of achieving that shared outcome. And then comes uh, the tricky part, all those planners out there who like to get into the details and the nitty gritty of how do you actually develop rules and policies that reflect Mātauranga Māori. There's some really good examples out there and what we found that is that there's a wealth of knowledge in terms of uh, plans that recognise and incorporate Māori values and perspectives. Probably the, the major challenge is trying to get that implementation in, into place. And that's through those applied actions, ngā mahinga. Uh, and then finally, once you have all that in place, it's always good to have some type of valuation framework to track your progress towards that shared outcome. And probably the gap at the moment is that while we have this awesome governance policy in place at that high level, what's missing is how do you track progress to uh, measure if we're achieving that shared outcome. How do you track Modi being restored within an urban environment? So that's probably a key gap, key challenge out there for someone to address. Some ideas around that include having holistic measures. It's got to include qualitative as well as quantitative factors to it. It's all good going down a path of having a, an index 
But that index has got to be backed up by that qualitative, that narrative, that cordial, that's part and parcel of that Māori worldview, that cordial, that kere to share in terms of that mana whenua early connection to whanganui and tara. That's valuable cordial. That influences how our processes for planning ought to be carried out. Te taha wairua. So in terms of a holistic framework for measuring, that includes the spiritual domain. So there's a big gap there in New Zealand's planning tradition in terms of how do you incorporate the spiritual, how do you incorporate those esoteric, metaphysical values that we all have, not just Māori, Pāgi as well, all those spiritual values and connection that we have to a place. How do you include that into our assessments of whether we're achieving those goals? <coughs> Te tāra kiko kiko, that does, that's involved with the, the biophysical indicators, probably a bit more straightforward and easily measurable, easily identifiable. <clears throat> Equally important is te taha whānau, all those family social indicators that tend to get dropped off in terms of our assessment of whether we're achieving those objectives or not. Arotake is just about assessing and importantly underpinning it all is whakapapa, recognising those connections that people have not only to place but to each other. A couple of case studies to probably provide examples of Māori values that have been incorporated. So Te Whāraki is a property development that was carried out by Ngai Tahu Property in conjunction with Lincoln University, based uh, close to Lincoln in the South Island there. Some of the examples of how they carried out objectives that are aligned to mana whenua values include recognising that uh, the natural environment is, is key for mana whenua, particularly with regard to access to mahinga kai, or species that of traditional importance, species that were used for harvest, like tuna or eel. So I did this work alongside Craig Pauly. So Craig Pauly used to work with Ngai Tahu, but he's also with um, Bothamistal nowadays, but he's also a key member of Te Aranga, alongside o. Hoskins and Co. Mm. So what uh, is generally easily achievable in terms of having a Māori footprint in these urban environments is design. So you might see sculptures, you might see various um, types of designs on the footpath, on the fences, they recognise Māori artwork or um, mahi toi. But what's important is that that type of artwork needs to reflect the whakapapa of that area. You've got to have that connectivity back to the local people, otherwise it's just a scribble, otherwise it's just a design that is meaningless. So you've got to have that connection based back to the people of that area of Mana uh, And then there's also those impacts around um, having good landscape design, minimising the impact of uh, the built environment, such as the roads, such as the, the runoff that impacts on those streams and those waterways and those wetlands in the area. What the property developers have done for both the Whāraki and another example, Pegasus, is actually help restore some of those natural environments, such as the wetlands, because the wetlands are very important as a food source for mana whenua. So it's all about recognising um, those important natural features as well, as incorporating the design elements into these urban environments. One way that they do it in Pegasus is street naming. So street naming recognising local history, so Pegasus is another town that was done by the Infinity Group back at the time, but now they're called Todd Group. And they actually had street names that recognised the significance of the area to Mana Whenua, like Marakai is the street name here, you probably can't see it too clearly, but Marakai is a food gathering area. And in that particular area where that street is, is where Mana Whenua used to gather resources such as eels and uh, freshwater fowl. And then there's also the recognition that um, you know, if you've got important sites like Wahi Tapu on your development, that you acknowledge it, fence off, and maybe celebrate it. So what the Todd Group did here is they put some design work in there, landscaped it, recognised it as a Wahi Tapu, put some you know, semi-palisades in there. And originally that area there with Wahi Tapu was going to be Fairway 8. 
<laughs> and they decided that hey, we're not into all about money. We're going to recognise that Indigenous people have a footprint in that area. We want to bring that back that history. And so they brought back that uh, Waitabu and have provided access rights to whānau from the area to celebrate in that area. <clears throat> so what are the other key findings that we've come up from, from these two case studies and the work that we've done in the, in the urban environments and planning? What are the huanga matua? So as I mentioned before, there's a lot of good work out there, a lot of good reform planning and policy that provide really useful guidance. The key challenge is now, how do you take that guidance, how do you take those policies, how do you take the legislation and implement it into practice? So there's uh, ways about that, and that's utilising the resources and the tools from the Sustainable Cities Centre, as well as Te Arana. So there's some guidance out there for people. The uh, Māori Urban Design Guide within the uh, Auckland Council is another starting point that Kiriata referenced as well. Uh, connectedness is always good, so if you're a planner, if you're a developer, what we've found is that with both of those examples from Ngaitahu and the Todd Group is that they had really good relationships with mana whenua, and they kept them involved in the planning process. They kept them involved in any of the development. So if there were changes in the plan for the development in an area, they informed mana whenua and got their feedback. For example, they talked about um, introducing in Pegasus a, a lake, a man-made lake, and it was in an important area. And Todd Group were just going, or well, Infinity Group at the time, were just going to put in a, a lake for rowing. But the mana whenua involved said, hey, uh, we also got interest in their culture interest. We want to bring back our, our hākina kina, our interest in sports. And so they, the Infinity Group, allowed mana whenua to be able to have wakalama races on that particular man-made lake. They tried to reintroduce tuna eels back into their lake as well, but I don't think the, the environment, my physical environment, was suitable for them. However, they did get them back into the wetland that was close by. To get this type of activities going, to get that real strong connections, you need advocates. You need people who are, you know, like the likes of Craig Pauling and Ro Hoskins and Co. from Tiarana, who have the skills of both planning as well as the skills in Te Ao Māori. You need those dual world views, the ability to be able to take and assess what the requirements are from a Western planning tradition and figure out from a Te Ao Māori position how do you actually take those values that Māori have and implement it within that type of framework. So you need people with those dual ideologies from that first slide that I presented to be able to implement those values. At the same time you need leadership within the property developers, within mana whenua, who are able to push those, those key kaupapa forward, those key topics forward, to advocate on behalf of mana whenua on the families who have the cold face, to advocate at that governance level in order to promote that whakaaro that we're trying to move towards a co-design, a clever approach for urban planning. And then, it's always important to have that these types of values embedded not only in the planning frameworks but also within the, the institutes, the developers that have created these plans for these property developments. These values have got to be reflected throughout the implementation of those plans. Otherwise, it's so easy for developers or any others who are investing in this area to default back to normal, to default back to mainstream, which is to maximise revenue for your beneficiaries. But if we have this alignment, this realignment back to these core sets of values, then we get better outcomes from those shared outcomes that the community and from one of you want, that are more aligned to those cultural values. And then as I mentioned before, need that Kaubapa Māori evaluation. So evaluation that's based on that Māori ideology, it's holistic and incorporates the notion of quantitative plus the qualitative. 
working together in order to come up with something that has got to be practical, it's got to be applied in order to be able to measure progress towards a shared outcome, but also to be able to better reflect those Māori values and principles from the previous slide. If we get all that right, then we're going to create awesome outcomes for not only our current generations, not only for those who are involved in planning and the people who are impacted by planning, but for those future generations. And that's probably the main reason that we're doing this work in terms of the incorporation of Māori values into this planning framework, is to ensure that there's intergenerational quality and to ensure that how we manage our natural resources is going to be of benefit for those future generations. So the question is around uh, how well have heavy management plans been implemented into the policy? I think there's been uh, a couple of generations of uh, EWI plans. So the first generation provided a lot of probably review of where mana whenua saw themselves within the landscape, within that natural environment. And I felt that those first generation of plans were a bit esoteric for mainstream planners to understand. And then the second generation of plans became more focused around uh, more aligned to the RMA provisions because even Hapu at the time felt that their values weren't being represented when they made submissions for the resource consent processing process and as a strategy they developed plans that were not so much aligned to those cultural values but were more aligned to the RMA processes in order to ensure that their aspirations were being met. And then now we move into probably the third generation where we're not so much getting every plans being developed, being developed, but in the case studies that are presented here today, these being much more probably applied application of those values through mana whenua forums, through joint committees, joint planning committees, either at a local government level or at a property development level. So we're moving towards a, a process where mana whenua now are being brought into discussions. I know the Greater Wellington have been doing a lot of this work as well, particularly with regard to freshwater, where you have these uh, fight to a committee set up and mana whenua feed right into it. So it's all good to have plans, but I think the the processes that collaboration provides, that provides more of a benefit in terms of actually getting the direct input from Māori into the, the planning processes that councils carry out. I think it's a really good question. Um, and anyone who's been following what was happening in, in Charlottesville and in the, in the South generally has been thinking about that a lot in how it relates to New Zealand. What do we do with the monuments which commemorate the soldiers who fought and died in the Maori Wars, you know, as though we started them? And there are a lot of those, and they're government funded and maintained by government. Funnily enough, Maori monuments aren't. I think that's a, going to be a long conversation. It's the same one as the treaty conversation. It's part of that. Who's values are privileged. How do we, but in fact, how do we work together to make that happen? So in Wellington, it's more the erasure of our memory. In other places, and obviously One Tree Hill is a good example, it's where some of the memory as recorded is a different story from the story that the, the we would like to tell. So don't have an answer. But I think there's a really big conversation, it's a 50 year conversation about how we do that. Personally, I don't like the idea of just getting rid of something without thinking about it long and hard. But I can absolutely see why 
you know, you might not want to have a statue of Robert E. Lee. Or indeed of some other people in New Zealand. So. In, um, in Gisborne, there's statues of Captain Cook and it was repeatedly defaced. Captain Cook and the, you know, the first rival went to Tuyamanui Akiwa, Poverty Bay was uh, fraught with problems, particularly from a mana family perspective. Uh, the approach that Gisborne took was to include the community, include mana family in those discussions in terms of how that history is represented. So I think if uh, civil society is inclusive in terms of how you recognise those monuments and inclusive of the wider community, I think that provides a potential process for going forward. I don't think you can just put it over onto the side. It's a part of our history, we need to recognise it. I provide the wider context and the broader picture around it. The approach that we took was to ensure that it wasn't a universal one, and that at the applied level, particularly when you come down into figuring out what those uh, values mean when it comes into a property development, was that we kept it broad enough so that you could swap out those values, you could swap out those particular principles. As I mentioned before, we wanted to take that approach because we recognise that here we have to have very context specific values, but then at one level we felt that there was shared values across iwi and hapu with regard to particular ethics and principles, e.g. kaitiakitanga. So kaitiakitanga, the ethical sustainability resource management seems to be a shared ethic amongst iwi and hapu. And, but the application of that particular principle will differ. So what Taranaki Whanui have in terms of how they look after the natural environment is probably going to be different from how much people look after the natural environment. So there will be those differences in terms of the application. So frameworks need to be broad enough to provide some guidance to people to group ideas around, but at the same time be flexible enough to be able to be context specific and recognise the, the application of those values within different domains within different areas. And that can be problematic if you're looking for universality or if you're looking at aggregation. That's why we were promoting the qualitative nature of some of the assessment tools, some of the uh, indicators, in order to recognise their context specificity and not trying to come up with a, a one-size-fits-all modiometer or modi indicator. <laughs> I mentioned Tarana because I've been really interested in seeing over the last two or three years how the council has taken on that challenge in Auckland. Um, one thing is, is actually having a Māori design campaign. But also they've tried to make the principles and the application as transparent and as open to people as possible. So there's lots and lots of stuff on their website and it's very accessible at the same time as linking to planning documents. But if we talk to Arana, and looked at the Wellington context, it would be very, very different. At the same time, it would have some commonalities. I'd love to see that happen. It would be a long process, and Auckland are finding that it's a, you know, it's a growing process. So we hope we look back in ten years and go there are four or five different urban centres where people are trying this. Yeah, just to kind of add on the uh, some additional thoughts is that the, these are just starting points starting points for discussions and I think it would wouldn't be a good approach to actually prescribe it to Mana Fenua, okay. but to actually provide, hey yeah, here's a framework, does this make where we can start our conversation? Mm. Yeah, that's a very valid point. There's a number of values now that or ethical positions that Māori are promoting, particularly with the post treaty settlement environment. A number of you in Hapu have these uh, institutes that I've called uh, Māori Asset Holding Institutes, or MAHI for short, <laughs> and they're there to make a lot of um, revenue for their shareholders. And so a number of you in Hapu are actually pushing back that their interest with regard to asset management, natural resource management, is just focused around being guardians, being kaitiaki, 
of the natural resource, but they do actually have resource, uh, they do actually have um, economic interests, and we call it, call it the term whakatimurawa, you know, growing the asset base. There's a huge uh, issue for a number of you in Hapu, and you see that with some of the earlier tribes that settled with their $1 billion assets that they now have, and there's tensions that have arisen between those entities, those institutes, who are the revenue generating arm of the iwi, as well as those folks who are quite uh, keen to look at ensuring that values like nākitanga, caring for people, caring for the environment, kaitiakitanga, sustainable resource management, are still aligned to the, the business interests of that particular entity. So there are those tensions amongst those values. And I think that it's playing out now. Uh, there's a number of examples that I probably won't get into in detail where there were tensions between Ngāi property and the runa in terms of how developments were carried out. Uh, the same thing happened with Tainui Group Holdings. There were tensions with regard to how developments are being carried out. And so at the moment, in terms of contemporary situation, there is a gap in terms of alignment between the multiple values that Iwi and we have, from Kaitakitanga, Manakitanga, Whanaunatanga, having that connectedness to that area, and Whakapapa, and how that gets applied within some of these developments that increasingly Iwi and are becoming key players in. And obviously we're seeing that play out at the moment around Shelley Bay, and that will continue to be the case. I'd also like to point out that the opening chapter of this book um, draws on the work of Billy Livesey, who did a very detailed case study of the Tainui experience, and her writing about that here and in other sources is really tackling those, those difficult issues of quite different worldviews and how that plays out in the planning context. It's really good work. So, for the Tanatu Board book, which is the early book, um, Sean and wrote a very good chapter on how that was planned for in, um, in Auckland. And in fact, what is interesting now is that some of that is actually those people are living in the houses that you were planning for. But certainly that is a, a guiding principle that's been considered in Wellington. And it's been a design principle, but it's also the problem is how does that fit with the planning system? Sometimes it's easy to be done. There's been some examples that have been that I've been talked to, that people are talking about informally where we've been completely blocked in doing something because the planning rules don't work. But again, it's a long standing process, we just have to keep working at it. Uh, actually, I know, the, I know the questions aren't for me, but um, um, inspired by the work of Sean and Kiriato and other Māori colleagues, we're planning with Cheryl Davies um, and the Urban Authority out of Wainui and Matamurai co-housing development. 60 co-houses there where the land will be owned um, by the Marae. Um, and um, it's going to be a renewable energy one with electricity companies. So those of you who are interested in that, we're trying to see Ian there, who's helping with the renewable distribution system, the renewable distribution system. So um, I think these ideas have been very inspirational, and I think it was a very, very good question, <coughs> and it provides that kind of shared vision, which I think is very useful. We've got time for another question or two. Oh, yeah. One quick observation. One of the things that I've got really interested in is how we break down that how home is in one area and where we work is somewhere very different, which I know we've thought about there. And particularly that's a subject of a lot of interest to um, the feminist urbanist movement. And I would, I, when I started reading this, I thought immediately of the connection between that and the way that we would like to be. How can we break down that that division or have a much more integrated process? Yeah. <laughs> that's a really good question and a relevant question. Yeah. So some ideas that uh, we have is that the current planners are pretty much set in their ways, engineers, very hard to get them to change their their approach in terms of you know, concreting everything. <laughs> piping everything. So what we're finding is that when we have opportunities to work with the planning schools through guest lectures or through 
committees that provide input into their programs, that we can get some really useful changes in terms of shaping those younger minds to be a bit more conducive or affable towards these alternative worldviews. And I think we're finding that the younger people are tending to be more responsive to these views. And at the same time, for those uh, colleagues who are currently in the planning profession, there's a lot of work that the New Zealand Planning Institute have been doing through uh, Papapaunamu, through the Māori related group there, that help promote uh, kind of Māori approaches within the planning uh, um, tradition. Well, obviously, the, if you don't have the opportunity to make direct contact, um, I was going to say Wellington Council is quite a good, in Wellington is a good place. Uh, if you, a lot of the, you know, it's going to differ around the country because Iwi and Hapu, some of them have very big corporate structures and that you can approach directly. And many of them have a person whose job specifically is to work with that design resource capacity. Um, and Wellington is a very small Iwi, very small trusts still in development, doing an amazing job, but um, still quite new. So we don't yet have the, you know, the huge infrastructure that some of the others do. But yeah, it's, it really is making the personal contact is really all you can do. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, compared to 10 years ago, there's been huge progress that's been made. I think civil society is just wanting to be more inclusive of the approaches that they're taking nowadays and being recognising, just recognising one of federal rights mm -hmm. in this space. And I think the Māori Urban Design Guide website on, uh, through Auckland Council has got a, oh, sorry, the Te mm -hmm. website has got a number of examples of where Māori values have been recognised within the urban landscapes. Mm -hmm. And there's a ton of case studies out there and it's, it's cool, it's awesome to see. Yes, there's still going to be a lot of resistance to that. And if you look at the work of the uh, things that happened around the Resource Management Act, and particularly Productivity Commission's recommendations, uh, I think a lot of us would think those were a significant step backwards. We don't quite know what will come out of that. But so the arc of justice, as Martin Luther King talks about it, never bends towards um, the good. Inevitably, things come and go. But I think over the 10 years, it's, it's just startling. When you look back at it, you can't believe what it was like.